TractorZoom is fueling dealership growth through integrated solutions, actionable insights, and empowered business decisions. Hello, everybody. I'm Associate Editor Ben Thorpe with Farm Equipment Magazine. Welcome back to another episode in our Used Equipment University series with TractorZoom. Today, we'll be getting into the multiplier effects of clean data. We have with us Ben Friedhoff. And uh, Ben, why don't you give us uh, an introduction on who you are and what you do? Ben Friedhoff, uh, General Manager of Used Equipment for Ziegler Ag. Um, we are a Fent, Agco, Challenger, Massey, Gleaner, uh, pretty much a whole echo umbrella, cloth dealer, um, north north central part of the country, Minnesota, Iowa, um, kind of hard in the Midwest, Wisconsin, Missouri. So, and for those of you who might know you, um, you spoke at last year's dealership mind summit on a very interesting rebuild uh, program you guys have with those Challenger tractors. So this is not first time connecting, right? It's um, enjoyable. Yeah, well, yeah, we were glad to have you. Okay, well, we can dive right into this one. We're going to be talking about clean versus dirty equipment data. So why don't we just start with kind of the ground rules of, of what that is. So if, if you were to give kind of the bird's eye view of, of what the difference between the two is, how would you explain that to someone and, and what that can do? Yeah, so, I mean, the kind of difference, uh, clean data, you know, is is the most accurate, uh, up-to-date. Um, you know, it's the it's what we base our... Our descriptions off of our, our build sheets for internal use um, it's what we sell off for the customer that kind of stuff um, on the actual equipment it can also be into the customer side of the you know business it's a prop you know, the correct address the correct telephone number the correct email um, and and maybe some other um, you know social media type stuff that we might advertise off of so the the clean data is what is the purest data for us to kind of do our jobs with versus, you know, a dirty, dirtier data. It, it's, it might be just generic model numbers or just a generic model and a serial number. It doesn't really give you a lot. Um, or, you know, in the, in the terms of a customer, it might be more generic, like age groups of customers or customers that are in certain industries kind of points you in the directional, um, you know, way of advertising or, or maybe, um, narrowing down into, into some needs or wants, but really doesn't deep dive into, into who that person or, or people are. So. Okay. What, so if you have dirty equipment data on your hands, what is the, some of the implications of what that can do downstream in your, in your operation and ultimately how can it impact your bottom line? Well, first and foremost, uh, I mean, when we start the process of looking at a trade, um, dirty data if we don't have you know the proper hours the proper age um, proper options on a piece of equipment it doesn't allow us to fully uh, evaluate that equipment accurately um, which is, is detrimental to us because we may not know what we're getting we may think we're getting more than we are or vice versa it's also detrimental to the customer because we may not be giving them a fair evaluation of what they're trading in if if we're missing you know an option for example on a tractor three point or PTO or auto steer of that nature. Um, you know, if that's not in that data, we're not including in the price, therefore they're not getting the full value. Um, as that process moves through then, if we get a piece in and it's traded in, um, and we do think it's got a few extra options and come to find out it really doesn't, you know, the auto steer got left in the shed, um, you know, the duels or tires got traded off sometime in between us looking at it and us getting into the system. Now, once we go and advertise that piece, it's kind of the gospel. And so if that's not 100% accurate, we have to kind of live with the consequences when we go to sell it to a customer. And this this kind of happens, I mean, as much as we try to fight it, it happens all the time. There's things that got moved around. There was a miscommunication on what was part of the trade um, with availability. The hours and, and delivery dates were stretching out. So maybe what we originally looked at came became something else by the time we've gotten it in here. So um kind of that implication um on the sale process that and then falls through even further so once we do have a piece and if it does change or it doesn't get recorded accurately and we sell that piece to a customer now it's entered into our system wrong so let's say we have a, a an update or um you know the customer calls in needing service work if we don't like know exactly what that machine looks like or what it has for options or what it has for hours that might have got missed or we might not be um the most efficient at doing a repair work on it 
because we get out to the machine and it's not exactly what we thought. So it causes inefficiencies in that standpoint and also can, you know, cause financial issues if uh, we miss out on a, a product improvement letter or something of that nature and it becomes an out-of-pocket cost after the fact. Sure. Okay. So if those are all the issues that this can cause, what are some what's, what are some things that you do to drive um, uh, clean data ingestion to make sure that you always have the most efficient data on your hands? So first off, we're working um, to, with a you know new appraisal app, trying to get down to a um, a very easy, um, controllable um, in data entry from the right from the shed door. We'll call it as a as a salesperson enters in to to look at that trade. Um, we do still have, you know, a few uh, in our team, we have two people that are kind of proofreading that data as it's coming in, make sure that, you know, the photos are aligning with what the, the verbiage is on those uh, appraisals. And then also once that unit is traded in, we're, we're working on a process to um, inspect, so to speak, those trades as they hit the ground um, to make sure they still match what we thought they did. Make sure the hours were still, you know, within range of what we expected that the front weights came in, the tires still that we thought were coming in did come in um, in, in trying to make sure it's the most accurate we can. And then the other side of that is we're trying to limit the human error as we go through. And so trying to make a very uh, uniform process, but also kind of limit the hands that can touch it um, just because less, less people interaction, the less, the less chance for, for mistakes. Um, and then once it does get onto the website, we we do have uh, two other kind of fail safes, you know, just good old fashioned, get on proofread one last time and uh, make sure the advertising is correct and that we're not missing anything. Mm -hmm. I know all about proofreading. Here I am <laughs> Takes a lot more time than one thinks. So. Yes. Yeah. So I and we're maybe touched on this a little bit already, but um, standardizing data ingestion, how you're bringing all that in. Do you have any recommendations for people on on how to kind of make that standardized process? Um, yeah, I mean, we try to build a, a form that's easy to follow that already has drop down menus so that, you know, everybody regionality, even within our own territory, has a little different way of describing a piece of equipment. Um, that if we have it into a form in a certain way that we want to advertise it, it's more pick and choose. Um, and therefore it's a more uniform data throughout. Um, and then we kind of always, we try to set standards of what, you know, what's in the industry. So um, certain advertising platforms have a kind of a cadence that they use when they advertise their pieces. And we try to stick to that so that a, it, it looks uniform, but then B also it's easier to maybe check and see if you missed anything. Cause if something seems out of order, you know, it's kind of mind muscle repetitiveness. If it seems out of order, you, you catch it right away. And so just trying to build some of those standardizations uh, into the process as much as we can. Sure. Is there any one particular piece of data that you find is usually comes in dirty or is, is usually missing? I'm just curious if there's one particular pain point along the way that you think people should, should really be looking at. In your um, experience. Yeah. You know, I think, I think in the last couple of years that the big pain point has really been around, um, you know, the ETAs and getting stuff in here in a timely fashion with OEM holdbacks and, and delays and in, in, uh, new machines so that, you know, we might have looked at a piece a year, 18 months ago, and we're still working through those. And, and now we're bringing it in. It's got one or two more seasons on it, more hours than what we expected may or may not, you know, an example of a combine have some damage, you know, from rock ingestion or some of that nature, that the information we had at the beginning was correct at that timestamp. Um, and as life went on and everything else worked through, the information got not correct, really by nobody's fault, other than we should have proofread it again and, you know, and try to double back on it. And we do have a policy in place to try to um, limit that by saying if it's more than so many days or so many hours out of this range, we need to reinspect that machine and, and update that data to try to limit those issues. It still happens. Um, and, and we just try to do the best we can. I'd say the second most heartburn um, uh, of area of heartburn would be kind of the open communication within the sales process to say, all right, Mr. Customer, we agree we're going to trade this unit in and we're getting, you know, the auto steer system and the full set of front weights. And maybe there's two or three people involved on the customer side. Maybe the salesman wasn't quite uh, 
accurate enough in communicating what was and what isn't coming in. Um, and, and by the time it comes in, maybe we've, you know, that, that time lapse has happened to where there's a little bit of argument on what was agreed upon. And so trying to, li- you know, limit that as much as you can. And it's an open discussion and it comes, um, comes with the experience on how to kind of work with that, with the customer. So. Sure. Okay. Very interesting. And, and one more question I had for you, and this one's a, this one's a little different. How do you think artificial intelligence might influence this aspect of our industry or, or um, improving how we work with equipment data? Yeah, you know, that's going to be kind of a tough one. Um, it, it's going to probably, I foresee it, I guess, looking at probably helping us um, come up with uh, you know, better programs that kind of describe the machines. Uh, one example I could think of is some sort of, you know, like a serial number reader that you can plug in any OEM serial number and it pops out um, the full build sheet and, you know, maybe some history, how it gets to that point, you know, whether it's data scrubbing or, or you know, agreements within um, OEM contracts, hard to say, but I could see that helping, um, you know, and otherwise I could see it all as well, working more on like what we talked about, the proofreading aspect of it, um, you know, and kind of make sure everything matches with what um, platform we're looking to do and, and take some of that off. Could it become down the line where, um, you know, it's maybe starts to replace some of the human interaction as far as um, uh, data opinions and that kind of stuff? It's possible, obviously, you know, we're, we're employing every technology you can to try to get the most accurate um, industry data, sales prices, you know, that kind of stuff. Anything to that nature will help. I think right now for the foreseeable future, we're still, you know, it's still at the end of the day, it's a, it's an opinion of value and uh, AI doesn't really write the check. So, um, you know, we're going to kind of take all that information we can and, and dive in and make a decision. And I, I think that'll stay on for, for a while yet. So. All right. Very interesting. Okay. We've, we've run through our formal topics here. I just wanted to ask you at the end, kind mm-hmm. of let you take the floor. If there's anything about this topic that we haven't covered that you think people should be thinking about, or are there any other tips or tricks you have around this topic that you think could help people out there who are trying to optimize how they handle data? Um, I guess there's probably not any real tips or tricks. It just takes kind of good old fashioned legwork. Um, you know, to go through and make sure it's accurate, it, it just takes time um, and it takes a process and you can kind of stick to it. I think the other side of it is, is good communication amongst your team to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that, you know, we understand um, when and where and what's coming in and what's not coming in and that kind of thing. And, and that's just a growing experience, even with, you know, obviously new people to the team, but as well as experienced people. Um, everybody's entitled to a mistake now and then, but uh, things change. And I say, I guess, you know, the biggest thing is to make sure that you stay on top of the data. Um, Like I said earlier in in my example, things change throughout the calendar year. We get more seasons put on stuff. It's really not anybody's fault that the data was wrong. It's just nobody went back to double check it or to update it. And so I would just say, take that time to, you know, kind of reevaluate things um, and make sure you're all on the same page. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's been very educational. Um, And thank you to TractorZoom for working with us on this series. And I'll talk to you later, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Ben.